morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Ken Levinson. Folks can please take their seats. We're going to get started. Uh, we are, are delighted to have all, all of you here today. We've had uh, two terrific programs uh, since the inauguration. The first one looking at the order adjustment tax and then looking at NAFTA. There's been a lot of interest in those topics. And the third big issue in that panoply is China uh, that people have been uh, focused on since the election. Uh, we've just been trying to, was trying to get ahead of the curve a bit with our discussions of the future of trade, which we started even before the election. But clearly, uh, that uh, the election and the, the, the assuming the presence of uh, Mr. Trump has brought us to a different uh, uh, set of issues that I think some of the folks thought maybe we'd be looking at uh, when we got into 2017. Uh, in the midst of all that, while we were looking at the future of trade, our first speaker, John Pomfret, was looking at the history of U.S.-China trade to kind of, I think, give us some perspective on where we are today. I'll introduce John in just a moment. Um, I want to put on people's agendas, uh, March 3rd, we have our annual congressional trade program where we have the four trade councils from the Ways and Means and Finance Committees be coming to talk. Uh, I think there's, I know that there's a lot of interest in their views of where we're headed uh, and how they see the, the trade agenda moving forward this year. Uh, we will have a robust set of programs coming out of that uh, going into uh, later March and into April, which we'll be announcing shortly. We hope folks will take a look at our website, uh, both WIDA.org and America's Trade Policy. Dot com and our next gen trade initiative. We're actually going to be posting a new piece uh, later today on supply chains. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over uh, to our first speaker, John Pomfret. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled, John, that you could be here. Uh, uh, John will tell his story himself, uh, but I will say that he uh, uh, flew in this morning actually on a red eye, so uh, I'm extremely grateful for him making his schedule work to be with us today. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated by the book, uh, John. Um, I, I work, have worked on China-related issues for 25 years, but I don't think I had kind of a depth of understanding of the history of the relationship. I was very focused on the current. And uh, what I think you'll find, and I don't want to preview the book too much, is uh, it seems like it's cyclical, that there are ebbs and flows in the American trading relationship and the, the per almost personal relationship between China and America that goes just beyond the, the commercial part that is just so fascinating from uh, reading your book, John. I, and I'm, I'm delighted for you to be able to give some perspective because I think um, as someone who studied history, uh, that's what I did my graduate work in, uh, I think that history can often help guide us to today. So I'm hoping that um, with the context that you're able to set uh, with a discussion of, of you know, the history of the relationship, the trading relationship in particular, but the whole relationship, I think it'll help us as, as a trade community be able to better understand where we should be heading or maybe should head and how to deal with some of the challenges we face today. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. Um, I, don't, I think we're sort of in uncharted waters right now, so I, I don't know how much history can provide as a as a guide, but, but let me let me talk a little bit about the history of U.S.-China trade, uh, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Sean and we'll do Q&A. So, um, in 1783, the Americans were uh, in a pretty deep bind. Uh, the British, after we'd beaten them in the War of Independence, basically decided to uh, slap an embargo on American trade, and so we didn't have access to the Caribbean ports. And so several enterprising Americans came up with us this idea of why don't we just go to China to get our tea there and break the British embargo. And it was basically this Hail Mary pass, this idea that somehow our trade with the East, particularly with China, was going to save the United States. And so out of New York Harbor in 1783, a ship called the Empress of China left with a large cargo of American ginseng grows wild, still grows wild actually, it sells for about $2,000 a pound in China, if it's real. Uh, and it went to China and made a profit of about 30%, uh, which wasn't bad for the time. And that began this trading relationship. And very soon, all the major families in, on, on the New England seaboard were pretty much involved in the trade with China. And there was this idea initially that was posed in the Senate about whether the United States should set up a trading monopoly similar to what the British were doing in Asia at the time, the East, the, the East India Company. And there was a debate about it. And Rufus King, uh, who was then the senator, a senator from New York, stood up and said, 
basically, we don't want to follow the British model. We need to have what he called private adventurers lead the trade with Asia. And so very early in the foundation of the United States as an economic power was inserted this idea that private enterprise and not state monopolies really had to lead the way. And China was intimately involved in helping us kind of go into that direction. And we began, of course, to compete, to compete with the British. Now, the British were a massive trading power, and we were relatively small compared to them. But we, along with our Chinese partners, got into a variety of basically capers to help break the East India mon monopoly. We did copyright ripoff uh, operations, basically packing, pa packaging American stuff as, as British stuff. We uh, broke the British embargo on trade in India. We actually ran opium along with the British, but in competition with the British, pushing down the price of opium. We were involved in lots of shenanigans in c competing with the British, but also working with the Chinese. And those shenanigans helped to create the foundational fortunes of the United States. So the Astors, the Lodges, the Forbeses, as in John Forbes Carey, these people made their initial fortunes in the trade with China, and they reinvested that money into the United States, first into rail, then real estate, insurance business, financial businesses, which began to slowly, over the course of time, turn America into what became, for the 19th century, the factory of the world. Then there was born the idea that China was going to save the United States. China was intimately involved in the growth of America. And so, the first, uh, later on in the, in the middle part of the 19th century, the first American who came up with the idea of a transcontinental railroad came up with the idea of, a, of, a, of what he would call an iron highway linking the West Coast uh, with the East Coast, but China uh, to, to the west of the world. So basically his idea was that Chinese trade was going to come to the West Coast and then get to the rest of the world via the East Coast ports of the United States. In fact, the and when they were drawing the boundaries of the state of Missouri, there was a debate about and pushing the boundaries of the state of Missouri farther west so they could be just a little bit closer to China. So this idea was, was, was very much that China was going to be America's savior in terms of trade. It was very much part of the whole DNA of America as it grew. Uh, this idea, of course, continued after the 1970s when America reopened to China. Uh, the idea that through trade, uh, America was going to change China, make China more liberal and democratic, if, if you will, but that China was going to continue to enrich the United States. And in many ways, that idea has continued in some cases up until today, although now I think you see a sort of a break with that tradition uh, with, these, the, with, with the administration. First, you can see it's significantly happening under Obama, but now it's continuing under Donald Trump. Uh, and so I think from, from what Ken said, I think that a, to a certain extent, history does provide a guide because we can understand some of our kind of beliefs and hopes about China, but clearly now we're at a very, very different time. And one of the reasons I think we're at a different time is because from the 1840s, when the first American president, in this case John Tyler, wrote to the Chinese, Americans have always really believed that a strong, stable China was in the best interest of the United States. And we basically carried that policy and doubled down on that policy in the 1970s up until today. But now we have a strong China. And I think Americans are like, oh, hmm, uh, is it in our interest? And I think we're at this very fascinating moment right now where not just Republicans and not just people in the Donald Trump administration, but also Democrats as well have, are having sort of a time of, 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 of concern that is this the country that we actually thought we'd be working with uh, when we first began to trade with them way back when, but then uh, obviously uh, through the WTO accession in 2001, et cetera. We have a strong China now, but is it the China we actually thought we'd get? In one of his last interviews with President Richard Nixon before he before he died, basically raised the question, have we, have we as Americans, in enabling and really helping China's rise, created a Frankenstein? And I think that that's an open question. I hope we haven't. But it's something that, 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 that you know, we could, we, could, we could look about, we could, we could talk about. So with that, that's my short comments. I want to throw it over to Shane and then to your questions. So thank you very much. Thanks, John. And uh, 
I, uh, uh, I'm glad you didn't bring up a, a, a phrase that, that jumped out at me from, from, from your book, but I'm going to bring it up because uh, it will forever change the world, the way in which I, I, I looked at, at trade and perhaps uh, for those here in this room. When you talk about this kind of long history in the book of, of commercial intercourse, I think was your, uh, your, your, your phrase, which uh, puts a whole new shine on, on, on trade, and I will forever uh, think of China differently. Uh, the, um, um, I, you know, so, so, so I, I, I think you, you've talked about this, this, this fear of the, of the Frankenstein um, and uh, in regards to China, but clearly uh, uh, some people would argue that uh, the U.S. election kind of created uh, its own monster here uh, in, 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 in terms of in, in terms of the administration, in terms of trade, I mean, there's a lot of fears out there of a uh, of, of a trade war with, with with China and so on. You recently uh, relocated from China. When 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 you're sitting in China, or when you were sitting in China, how were the Chinese viewing uh, Donald Trump and, and his accession? So you you see the Chinese as sort of the government now pivoting with Trump's election. And you see Xi Jinping's speech at Davos. You see the Chinese. You see the Chinese announcing that they they're cutting the number of areas that uh, from uh, from which foreigners are banned in terms of investing in China's economy. You see the Chinese basically repackaging themselves as the, the last defender of globalization, which is a bit cynical. But you see them clearly kind of um, uh, pivoting off Trump uh, to to repackage themselves uh, internationally and globally. Um, Domestically, among, amongst my Chinese friends, there was a lot of fascination with Trump, uh, a lot of sense that there was a real possibility for a, best, a better relationship with America, uh, with the administration of Donald Trump. Now there's a lot more concern than that, uh, simply because of the maddening unpredictability. In fact, some Chinese, there's a wonderful Chinese blog post written about Trump's inaugural speech in which a Chinese Maoist says, this guy doesn't sound like Andrew Jackson, he sounds like Chairman Mao. Um, uh, you know, basically, in his America First, I hear the echoes of Mao's great 1949 speech that the Chinese people have stood up. In his desire to create a to sort of smash global elites, you see Mao Zedong's speech that we're creating a people's government. And then, um, in his maddening unpredictability, we see Mao's favorite aphorism, which is, there is chaos under heaven. The situation is excellent. And in fact, you can probably hear Kellyanne Conway sort of saying that at a certain point in the next week or two. Um, so there's this, there's this sense of, OK, he's transactional. He's a businessman. We can do business with him. But there's also a fear because of his unpredictability. Have we ever seen populism kind of shadow the relationship before in quite this one? Yeah, so uh, America has you know, kind of a a schizophrenic view of China. We have this great respect, this, this sense that China will kind of help us together, will create a new wonderful world, but also at the same time we have these undercurrents of the yellow peril. And then, so go, go back to the 1870s in California with the rise of the California Workingmen's Party. This was a very powerful organization, was a local political party, that was very extremely influential in California. And by the 1880s, they had convinced Washington to block Chinese immigration of Chinese laborers. In fact, the Donald Trump shout, build the wall, actually first came into the United States in the 1880s because of the California Workingmen's Party, which complained about Chinese illegal immigration coming over the Mexican border. Not Mexican, but Chinese. Um, and, and that strain of kind of uh, hating the Chinese worker, fearing the Chinese worker, I think is a kind of, in a way, part of the DNA of America has continued to this day. But that commercial intercourse has always played a larger role in, 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 in the relationship. You see that, and uh, I mean, just talk about business and the relationship now. I mean, you talk about those foundational fortunes right. uh, being based on on, on, uh, on trade with China. Clearly, there's a lot of American business that have a huge interest in, in, in China that are drawing a lot of revenues from China. As well. Definitely. Um, I mean, obviously, the trading relationship is the most important trading relationship both they have and. I mean, it, it, it jumps around the United States from number one to number two to number three, but nonetheless, it's hugely important. That said, you do really, you really see a sea change in how the business community views China now versus, let's say, a decade, 15 years ago. Uh, there is a, a considerable uh, a neuralgia and worry that the Chinese, in some cases, aren't carrying out their WTO uh, uh, 
uh, agreements, for example, in terms of opening up the payment sector, the credit card sector to competition. And then there's also a, a raft of non-tariff barriers that the Chinese has set up in order to block American business to, do, to, to make money in China. And in addition, there are joint venture requirements, which it, it, if you're a high technology company and you want to manufacture your high tech in China, you need essentially to give your family jewels to the Chinese, which will then create a competitor to you in five years uh, in, in, in exchange for access to the market. And that is a, is a real sea change you're seeing among the business community, and much more uh, a much less rotated-eyed view of the Chinese than we we, we heard, let's say, at least during the in, during in, 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 in the in the Clinton years. Right. So I mean, you've talked about the, the, the kind of the barriers to American business in China and stuff, but we also have a, an increasingly dynamic Chinese corporate sector uh, as well. How do you see that shaping the kind of competition and conversation? So before? that that's also a cause of some concern because you have the Chinese adopting a policy that has a tendency to coddle their monopolies. And for example, in the insurance, in insurance business, 6% of the insurance business in China is Western uh, because of non-tariff <coughs> barriers. And so the Chinese have very profitable, very profitable insurance business. So they create these large mega Chinese companies, which then in their, the profits they've made in the protected market are turning around and going overseas to buy insurance companies overseas. And so that again is a cause of concern. Now, in, in addition to that, you also have some very active, very creative Chinese companies which are competing with American firms directly, head-to-head. Uh, -head. But again, in, in the China environment, many of them are so protected that they kind of move up the value chain there, get their profits, and then go overseas to begin, begin, doing, begin doing mergers and acquisitions elsewhere. And the sense is that the playing field now clearly is skewed um, in a protectionist direction in China, which kind of explains to a certain extent uh, Trump's reaction to this. Right. How do you read uh, how do you read what we've seen in terms of dealing with China out of the uh, out of the administration so far? So we had before Christmas this call with uh, the Taiwanese yeah. president, uh, this raising of the possibility of walking away from the one China policy, and we had the Chinese uh, offer silent treatment in response for when he first took office, and finally this call which one of the first things that Donald Trump did was to affirm the, the one China policy. How do you read that, and how, how might the Chinese be reading what they've seen so far? So, it, so far, actually, um, he's followed a bit his predecessors, right? Almost, except for Obama. Almost every president since Nixon has always run on a platform of changing the China policy of, 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 of his predecessor. So Carter said he would not use Carter's language ask his, sorry about that, but ask his the Chinese like Nixon did. But then Carter changed his policy. Uh, you see Clinton criticizing George H.W. Bush for coddling the butchers of Beijing. And then he changed his China policy. And so, so that is something that, that I think Trump falls, he falls into that category. How did the Chinese view his back and forth on this? Well, there's one view that says, says the Chinese look at Trump and say oh, he's a paper tiger. Right, he was going to do this, but he didn't do this. We pushed him around, so you know we can we can take advantage of him. The other view is that okay, Taiwan's off the table. Now we can start to deal with the Americans because we're actually quite worried that they're going to become increasingly protectionist. And, and at least on the on the sovereignty issues, he's okay. So we need to work to help him to help him help him help himself and not shut off our trade. Because even though the percentage of of, of China's economy devoted to that's relying on exports has dropped considerably. They still really need a productive relationship with America in order to continue to modernize. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, part of the reason that, that, that reliance on exports is dropping is because they're trying to pivot the economy towards more services and consumption driven economy, which looks a lot more like the US economy and raises the kind of possibility of all sorts of new uh, rivalries, right? I mean, kind of if all of a sudden, U.S. services companies are, are, are competing against Chinese services companies. I mean, do you see that happening? Is that is that a way the, the economic relationship is going is to pivot? Or are we still, uh, for a, a good long while now, going to be talking about uh, kind of cheap Chinese imports, consumer goods, and, and so on? No, the Chinese are, are very clear about tr creating an economy for the 21st century. They're putting massive amounts of money into services, but also into automation. To biopharma, to aeronautics, into renewable technology, 
Uh, now, not all that money is well allocated because capital allocation in China is still not done, quote unquote, rationally. That said, they're preparing their economy for the next, for this century, for the next one after that. And so, clearly, on a broad front, they want to move up the value chain, which means they're going to be bumping up against all sorts of American companies in the advanced industrial sector, but also in services as well. If you were uh, to be called over to the White House after this, and, uh, and Donald Trump said, young man, come into my room. That didn't come out very right. Uh, it was that commercial intercourse thing that got me started. Uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, come into this Oval Office, man, uh, and, and tell me what are the three things I should be doing uh, as a rational actor to be dealing with China today? So, um, I, th I am sympathetic to the view that's been expressed by a few of my friends who are in the administration, and also Democrat people in the Democratic Party in the previous administration, who were frustrated with China, and who have a sense that the Chinese have played the United States, at least for the last decade, if not for longer than that. And that there is a lot of imbalance in the relationship, and it's got to be righted somehow. The question is, on the economic side, how do you write the relationship? Because confronting China in that area in a tit-for-tat trade war is kind of a, it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a dead-end game. But pushing the Chinese on non-tariff barriers and that type of stuff <coughs> involves actually not just simply a more fractious relationship with China, but a more <coughs> fractious relationship with multinationals. You kind of put, you, can, you have to tell GE, no, sorry, GE, you cannot give the Chinese all your technology, right? And GE might want to do that because that's market share for them and very important. And so that creates a much more fractious relationship, not just with the Chinese, but also internally. And it also necessitates that you have a much better economic relationship or understanding with Germany, because that's the other country that the Chinese are, if you will, preying on. Basically, an average of about one German company a week is being bought by the Chinese. Now, the Germans have cottoned on to this and are you know, trying to deal with it, but, but it involves a, a lot, not just our relationship with China, but our the government's relationship with business and, and the government's relationship with other industrial powers. And that's getting that right is very tricky. Um, and I would say you, would need, you need to do all three things. Okay. How, how should we be reading uh, uh, China's place in, in the Asia Pacific now. You talked about them positioning themselves as the kind of new champion of globalization. I was at APEC in, in Peru in November. It was striking to see Xi Jinping stand up and say, come to me, I'm the defender of free trade. And he did that again in Davos earlier this year. Uh, I, I um, uh, Clearly, the TPP was the Obama administration's response. Right. Uh, President Trump has pulled the US out of that. Uh, we also have China building this one belt, one road. Uh, sending trains all the way through to London, carrying goods, uh, and so on. Do you think that um, that is something that the U.S. can now strategically? Uh, how does the U.S. respond to that? Can you can you can you stop that, or is it a kind of inevitable return of of, of China as a dominant power in the Asia Pacific? So um, I don't. From I look at China as a dominant power in the Asia Pacific as a natural. I, I mean, they're big, right? And they're in Asia. Um, but I, I look at the TPP as it is probably the most damaging thing the United States has done to itself since the Viet in Asia since the Vietnam War, because it seeds the field to China. And regardless of what you mean, the withdrawal from the, the withdrawal. Yeah. And, re and regardless of what you think the TPP would do for an American worker, it, it's a it, it, it's a, a an organization that was created with America's friends and allies. And it was a template for not just trade relations amongst these allies, but also trade relations with China, because China was never considered to be a, a total outlier. There was always the option that China could join. And it hurts not just the US position in Asia, but also hurts the position of reformers in China who, wanted, who would want to use their agreements in order to force change in China, because the Chinese traditionally have this this history of using inter international agreements as a way to change China's economy. And its disappearance 
clearly is going to hurt not just the U.S. position in Asia, but China, the position of, of the, the course of China's economic reforms internally. Okay. Why don't we throw it up, open to the room there? If you've got a question, why don't you raise